This meeting is being recorded. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. We'll get started in just a minute or two and we will be back shortly. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Rosie, can you kick us off? Excellent. Hello. Welcome, everybody. I am so glad to be here with you today. My name is Rosie Higgs. I'm the Director of Programs here at the Nonprofit Association of the Midlands, and I'm excited to serve as your moderator today. Um, we would like to thank all of our candidates who were able to attend today, as well as our nonprofit experts, and uh, as, of course, all of our attendees who were able to join us today. A couple quick housekeeping things. We have enabled closed captioning for this forum. To turn that on, you'll see a button at the bottom of your screen that says live transcript. You'll click that and then click show subtitles to turn on closed captioning for yourself. The forum today is being recorded and will be made available after. Um, just a reminder that this is a nonpartisan forum for educational purposes or informational purposes only. We will put in the chat more information on the Johnson Amendment and why this is crucial for nonprofits. And to be fully transparent, we have invited all the candidates running for the legislature. We would also like to thank our partner for this event, the Coalition for a Strong Nebraska. And I'd now like to hand it over to Hannah Young. There we go. Would not work for me. Perfect. Thank you, Rosie. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah Young and I am the Public Policy and Communications Manager at Nonprofit Association of the Midlands. I want to again thank all the candidates for taking time out of their busy election season schedules to be with us today. For those who do not know, Nonprofit Association of the Midlands, or NAM, is the only membership organization in the state dedicated exclusively to working with nonprofits. By connecting organizations with information, education, advocacy, and collaboration, we help members focus their energy on the people and communities they serve. One of my priorities at NAM is education around nonprofits' vital role in our economy. So a few fun facts about nonprofits. One in 11 people work in Nebraska, work at a nonprofit in Nebraska, so that employs over 90,000 people. We have over 13,000 nonprofits in our state. Nebraska is ranked sixth highest in volunteerism across the nation, and 84% of Nebraskans report charitable contributions, averaging a little over $5,000 apiece. Now that I've told you a little bit more about NAM and the importance of the nonprofit community, I will read a little about our partner, Coalition for Strong Nebraska. The Coalition for Strong Nebraska builds capacity for and facilitates collaboration among the nonprofits that work on poverty-related policies by providing training and education on legislative advocacy, lobbying rules, and the policy content for member organizations. CSN's mission is to advance the knowledge and participation of nonprofits in policy advocacy and enable nonprofits to take a unified action to make systemic change for the benefits of those they serve. We are grateful for our partnership and look forward to what we can do in the future. Lori, the executive director of CSN Apologizes, she is unable to be on camera today, but she is here. She recently had surgery, so sending good vibes to her. 
I would like to now introduce you to Melissa Brazil, who will give you a short presentation about voting in the state of Nebraska. Hi, good, ever good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Brazil, and I serve as Director of Communications and Policy for the Nebraska Civic Engagement Table. Um, just a bit about us at the Nebraska Table. Our mission is to work with nonprofit, nonpartisan organizations to increase voting and build an engaged Nebraska. Our goal is to increase the share of voter turnout among marginalized communities in Nebraska, build leadership among community members and our nonprofit partners, and ensure our voices are represented in the policy decisions that affect our communities, which leads us to this forum and to the election on November 8th. We're all affected by the policy decisions made by the candidates we elect. And as nonprofit advocates for the communities we serve, and as community members ourselves, we vote because there are important issues that deserve our attention and action. Because you're here tonight, we know that it's clear that you make an effort to keep up with the issues that are important to you, your friends, your family, your community. And you know that voting is about making an impact on the issues that are meaningful to you. As a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, we at the Nebraska Table don't take a position on specific candidates. However, the Nebraska Table does take positions on a couple of issues that you'll see on your ballot. You may have heard um, about two ballot measures. Um, those are Initiative 432, which is a voter suppression tactic that the Nebraska table opposes, and Initiative 433, which is an effort to increase the minimum wage and that we as the Nebraska table do support. You can learn a bit more about these ballot measures at the following links, and I'm going to go ahead and drop those in the chat. Here we go. And um, so also, of course, regardless of how you vote, though, we do want to make sure that you have the information that you need to cast your ballot. Um, whether you prefer to vote in person or by mail, here are a few dates to know. And I am, again, going to be sharing some of this information in the chat. So if you're a person who likes to vote early by mail, be sure to request your ballot by October 21st. And after you receive your ballot in the mail, um, we recommend returning it in the mail by October 28th, or you can use a postage free Dropbox um, by election day, um, by the end of the day. I'm going to, again, drop um, a couple of links and information here in the chat. Um, and so this information shows some dates and also links to where you can find an application form for an early ballot. Um, and also information on your county election commissioner and their contact information so you can return an early um, early ballot application. And of course, um, if you like to vote in person, you can do that early um, as of today at your county election office. And always um, it's an option available to you to vote in person on election day, which is also a lot of fun and exciting, I think. Um, so as part of your voting plan, um, of course, be sure to check your voter registration to make sure it's current, um, especially if you've moved or if you've changed your name, you can check that at um, voter check. And I am going to just drop this link in the chat and um, Hannah or whoever at NAM is helping um, boost these links. Thank you very much. Um, finally, if you'd like more information about the candidates or other election information, the League of Women Voters has a voter's guide available on their website, and I'll also drop that in the chat. We're just, we've got all the links and all the information coming at you in your chat. Um, but anyway, but my, my challenge for you um, this evening, before I turn it back over to Rosie, um, is to help someone close to you make their voting plan. Um, you are all engaged. You're showing up here tonight. You care about the issues. So you know how important it is to get others involved as well. So please make your own voting plan and help a neighbor or loved one make their plan as well. Um, that's it for me. Thank you all so much. Um, and now I'm back over to Rosie. Thanks, Melissa. That was excellent. All right. I think we're ready to introduce our candidates. So how this will go is I will say your names in order of district, and then you have one minute to tell everyone your name, uh, where you would be represented, representing if elected, and your nonprofit experience. So we will start with District 4, Cindy maxwell Ostick. Thank you. I'm Cindy maxwell Ostick, and I'm an independent. I'm running for Nebraska Legislature in District 4, which is West Omaha. And if I'm um, 
elected, our district boundary lines have changed a little bit. I always recommend everyone go to the Nebraska legislature website, put in your address and make sure you realize which district you're in because some people are surprised. Um, as far as nonprofit experience, when I first moved to Omaha, my uh, first position was to work for Newcastle Retirement Center. It was actually an organization uh, sponsored by this Franciscan um, uh, by a group of nuns. And so I had experience with them for a few years. And then I have volunteered with many organizations um, uh, over my adulthood. And then in these uh, last few years, I've been involved directly with a nonprofit that we formed called Rank the Vote Nebraska. And I'm the president of that. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move to District 6, Christian Merch. Hi there, my name is Christian Merch. Uh, I am running for legislature for District 6. Uh, I was an Omaha police officer for a little over 10 years. I worked uh, all over our city, uh, worked with uh, different nonprofits during that time, uh, became an attorney, went and worked for the Nebraska Supreme Court, and then went out into private practice and back into law enforcement on a part time basis just to help out. Uh, I do serve on the board of directors for a nonprofit dedicated to uh, education to prevent human trafficking. Uh, and so it's uh, been very, very rewarding for me to be able to share my, uh, my experience from law enforcement and uh, practicing law uh, with, with folks to, to prevent human trafficking, which is a major issue for our state. Excellent. Thank you. Next, District 6, Senator Michaela Kavanaugh. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Michaela Kavanaugh. I represent District 6 running for re-election. It's West Central Omaha, roughly from 72nd to 144th Pacific to Maple, but it kind of zigzags throughout there as well. Um, I have worked in nonprofit for quite a while. I um, was the de development director for Opera Omaha. I also was the development director for Servants of Mary, which is the order of sisters that funded my found in my high school, Marion. Um, and I have done other various work in development ever since then. Uh, primarily my experience is obviously on the fiduciary side as I'm raising money for nonprofits. I've worked with the Nebraska Arts Council in doing um, applying for the grants and going through that process of advocating for additional funding at the state level. And then on the state side, I've been there to help with the additional funding on the state side to the Arts Council. Um, I've also served on nonprofit boards as well, bringing sort of that understanding of how budgets work and the responsibility of a board member to ensure the integrity of the financial status of a nonprofit, in addition to making sure that all of the audits and things like that are um, what they should be. So thank you. Thank you. Next from District 8, Senator Megan Hunt. Hi everybody, I'm Megan. I represent District 8 in the Nebraska Legislature, which includes the neighborhoods of Dundee and Benson, and basically the northern part of Midtown Omaha. Um, in 2012, I founded a nonprofit with a whole bunch of friends who were really fed up with experiencing harassment in bars and clubs and in our nightlife establishments called Safe Space Nebraska. And we worked with law enforcement, and bars and nightlife establishments to educate owners and staff about how to handle reports of harassment and assault. So I did that for about 10 years, eight years. And other than that, I've done board service with many nonprofits. I volunteered with many nonprofits, um, uh, including Nebraska Appleseed, Planned Parenthood of the Heartland, ACLU, um, Omaha Area Youth Orchestras I've been with for about 10 years. Um, so yeah, that's my experience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next up, District 10, Senator Wendy DeBoer. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Wendy DeBoer, and I represent District 10, which is much easier to describe than it used to be, so I'm very happy to do it. It goes from 90th to 156th Street on the north side of Maple, and it gets wider as it gets west. So there it is. So much easier than in the past. So that's what I represent now. Um, my uh, interaction with nonprofits actually has been uh, for most of my life. When I was a little girl, my sister died and my parents helped found an organization called uh, the Compassionate Friends here in Omaha, the 
the chapter that was here in Omaha. And um, I started working with their siblings group and, you know, was very active in that. Uh, basically, the rest of my childhood uh, went to all the national meetings and got my first start in public speaking there. <laughs> and uh, so I was uh, involved with that from that side of things uh, as a facilitator and, and all sorts of things growing up. Um, but since then, uh, I have mainly uh, worked with nonprofits with my work through the legislature. Uh, last year, I brought the bill for the food bank funding uh, from ARPA dollars. So we got $20 million for a uh, grant program and food bank dollars uh, to buy food for people um, that came out of the ARPA funds. So that's, that's what I've been doing with nonprofits. It's good to see you all. Excellent, thank you. Um, District 12, Robin Richards. Yes, so like she said, I'm Robin Richards from District 12, which is the majority of Ralston and then runs up to about Millard South in Millard. Um, I, I've lived here 85% of my life and six generations of my family have lived here. So we have deep, deep roots in this community. Um, as far as my nonprofit work goes, I actually grew up in the Nebraska Children's Chorus. I toured the world with them for 10 years as an ambassador for the city of Omaha with the Sister Cities program. So I grew up with the nonprofit experience and really understanding that the gaps that they fill in. Um, but I also uh, worked for the Nebraska Arts Council for the last year, five years. I was excited to hear Michaela talk about that. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. She does do a lot of work. Um, to advocate for the Arts Council. They are a state agency. And what they do is support nonprofits, all of the arts nonprofits in our state. In fact, Nebraska had the lowest number of arts nonprofits closed across the nation during COVID because of the work we did at the Arts Council. So we were very proud of that and keeping all of them going through such a hard time for the arts. Um, other than that, I've been very supportive of like, um, the programs that come into Ralston, like the One World Truck comes in, so that way our kids are getting um, health care and dental services. And then I also sit on several uh, boards that are not only arts boards, but education boards, uh, the Nebraska um, Association of School Boards, that sort of thing. So very familiar, very into supporting nonprofits, kind of dedicated my life to it. So thank you all for everything you do for us. Thank you. District 16, Connie Peterson. Hi, um, sorry, I wanted to make sure that was that was still, you could hear me, okay. Um, I'm Connie Peterson. Um, I am running District 16, which includes Washington, Cumming, Burt, and Stanton counties. Um, I'm actually a psychologist in Norfolk and a clinical director for the largest nonprofit um, organization here in Norfolk. We run um, two short-term residential and two outpatient clinics. Uh, here in Norfolk, as well as in Columbus. So I'm the clinical director over all of those programs. Um, of course, through my professional career, I've been involved in a number of nonprofit organizations, started just a few weeks out of high school working for a residential rehab facility out of Wayne, um, and really started kind of at that point. So the last 25 years really in my career have been focusing on nonprofit organizations. Um, I also am the Spring Branch 4-H club leader for the Hoskins uh, group of 4-H kids. So youth leadership is incredibly important to me. Um, and so really, you know, nonprofits are near and dear to my heart. I understand the process of that. Um, in my role as the clinical director for the last 15 years, I am uh, financially responsible for the nonprofit um, processes that we need to go through. So we have to be um, incredibly uh, innovative in how we use our services. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is District 18, Michael Young. Does not look like he was able to join us. So let's. Okay, on. so then let's move on to District 20, John Fredrickson. Hi there. Thank you so much for having us and hosting us tonight. My name is John Fredrickson. I'm running to represent District 20 in the legislature, which is uh, in West Central Omaha. Um, a little bit of my experience with nonprofits. So, uh, my background is I'm a social worker. So, um, nonprofits have played a very large role uh, both in my education, but also in my professional life. Um, I first got involved in the nonprofit world um, in high school. I was volunteering through Operation Others, um, and through my education, um, I've bounced all over the all over the world really with nonprofits, from the West Africa AIDS Foundation to Harlem United to the New York City uh, LGBTQ Community Center. So. Um, really uh, have a strong connection with nonprofits and uh, continue to work with them in my professional world too. 
Thank you very much. Next is District 26, George Jungen. Hello, uh, thanks again for having us here. I think everyone's gonna thank you for having us here, but thank you for having us here. Um, as she said, my name is George Dungan. I'm running to represent LD26, which is Northeast Lincoln, uh, not including uh, most of East Campus of UNL, but it's uh, most of the Bethany University place, that whole part of the area. Um, my experience with nonprofits mostly stems from my work as a public defender. Um, I served as a deputy public defender here in Lancaster County for, almost nine years, um, just left my job in the last couple of weeks, actually. Um, but in that time working for the public defender's office, I had an opportunity to work with juvenile court, misdemeanors, felonies through the entire gambit. And one thing that is integral to working with folks in that community is being able to cooperate with, partner with, and ultimately navigate the landscape of nonprofits. Uh, whether we're talking about placement for kids at places like Cedars, or trying to get people into uh, treatment facilities uh, when they're in pre-adjudicative community correction services or probation or post-release supervision. And so really a big chunk of what you end up doing as a public defender is trying to do the work of a social worker, which John, I, you, I can't even begin to be as uh, <laughs> good at that as social workers are, but we try our best. Um, I also currently serve on the board of the Bridge Behavioral Health. And so I am a board member um, for that organization, which focuses on getting people treatment, both respite care and short-term and medium to long-term residential treatment for substance use disorder, as well as mental health issues. So very near and dear to my heart. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to District 28, Jane Raybould. We got Hi, everyone. Thank you all for hosting. Uh, I'm Jane Rabel, and I'm running in Legislative District 28, which is Patty Pans and Brooks District. It's in the heart of Lincoln, Nebraska. It goes from 10th Street now to 84th Street and A to O Street. Uh, it's uh, a district that I was born and raised in. So I've been pretty active like everyone else on a number of boards, both locally and globally. Uh, in Washington, D.C., I was part of a program coordinator for what was called Community Improvement Days, working with D.C. Parks and Recreation and, and rehabbing a, a park center or a ball field or soccer field. And I was also a volunteer for seven years for Mother Teresa House for Infants in Washington, D.C., where we help women who, who chose to, to give birth to, to help them do so and to, to put their, their newborns up for adoption. In, in Lincoln, Nebraska, when we moved back to Lincoln, I started out at the Mary Ritma Ross Media Arts Center, Friends of the Ross, because uh, independent films, I really wanted to impress my adult children that their mom was really hip and cool and involved in indie, indie films. But I also was on the Clyde Malone Center, the African American Cultural and Community Center in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. I've also been on uh, the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce and also the Community Health Endowment Board of Trust where we were funders of so many nonprofits throughout the, the city of, of Lincoln. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is I've been on the Oxfam America Sister on the Planet Ambassadors for about 13 years, advocating for so many issues both here in Nebraska, but also globally. And I have been honored to, to travel with them to Jordan to visit the Syrian refugee camps. So we've advocated for women, women in agriculture, and uh, certainly for, for refugees and maintaining food aid uh, in the, the federal aid packets all around the world. Thank you. Next, we'll go to District 31, Senator Kathleen Kaut. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having us on. And I'm going to show everybody else. This is how you say my last name. Make it simple for people. Um, so I, uh, we've lived here about 10 years and we've moved around to a bunch of different places and have been involved with nonprofits in, in various ways throughout uh, my time around the country. My very first like real grown up job after college was as a job developer for individuals with disabilities. Um, they were, I, we were dealing primarily with people who had mental illness and needed to be able to get into the workforce. So working with people um, to become self-sufficient and to be able to work 
however best they can is something that's very much a passion of mine. Um, as, as we've moved around the country, I've been able to volunteer at different places, whether it's Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Um, I actually did a brief stint uh, working for NAM when we moved here as a contract worker. I uh, did some feasibility studies for the Catholic Diocese of Des Moines, uh, and then I'm involved with the veterans group here. So um, nonprofits are so good at filling a gap, a gap that government doesn't need to fill, but that people who have a deep, deep passion for a specific issue can jump in and make a world of difference. So I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Um, next is District 30, 34, Lauren Lippincott. Do not believe he was able, it doesn't look like he's able to join. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, so then we'll move on to District 36, Angie Lordson. Hey friends, my name is Angie Lordson. I'm a candidate for Legislative District 36, which is Southern and Western Sarpy and a little bit of Western Douglas County. Um, I actually started, I was on the Gretna Chamber Board when we first moved here to town. And then I started a nonprofit called Gretna Hometown Heroes. And I still currently am the program manager for that. And Currently, I sit on four other boards. My passion is to make sure that kids are growing up in safe homes. So on the policy legislative chair and the treasurer for Survivors Rising, we advocate for survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking for the state. I also serve on the board for Concord Mediation. We handle a lot of the juvenile justice um, and court-appointed mediation here in Douglas and Sarpy County. Elder care mediation, all of those things um, happen through there. And I also serve on the board for Lift Up Sharpie County. We help families that are facing homelessness and food insecurity within the county. So thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Next up, District 40, Barry Decay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for asking me to be a part of this. Uh, I'm running to represent District 40 up in the Northeast part of the state, which runs from Ponca, Nebraska to Stewart, Nebraska, which is about 170 miles across there. Uh, it's a fairly large district. Um, I do have to admit when it comes to nonprofits, I'm gonna be a, very much of a rookie at this. I'm using this as an informational um, tool for me going forward. Uh, a couple of things, if you wanna consider nonprofits and it has nothing to do a lot with what everybody with their experience in this has had um, but I we do do a uh, prescribed burning and uh, we use that some of that money to go to local fire departments to help out in the areas to help them get new equipment and things like that and as a basketball official uh, I have dedicated some time over the last 25 30 years uh, helping officiate anywhere from fifth uh, eighth grade uh, YMCA tournament basketball so in those games I do have to admit those games are a little tough to ref once in a while when you used to high school and college so but it's, it's been very rewarding to be a part of that but as I said before I'm a rookie at this and I'm just uh, looking forward to the information that I can gain from this. Excellent. Thank you. And last but not least, we have District 46, Danielle Conrad. Hello. Good evening, beautiful friends. Hello, Nebraska. Um, my name is Danielle Conrad. I'm running for legislature in Legislative District 46, which uh, I coined the Fighting 46 Legislative District during my previous stint uh, as a state senator representing North Lincoln for eight years. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm an attorney, and I have a pretty deep record when it comes to uh, nonprofit service and engagement. I've dedicated my life to public service, and I started out my career as a young lawyer building the policy program at Nebraska Appleseed. During my eight years in the legislature, I worked hand in glove with groups like NAM and CSN uh, to facilitate some really important public-private partnerships in our state, spanning from child welfare to environmental justice to arts and humanities. Um, and over the, the last eight years, since I was forced into constitutional retirement by 
term limits, I led uh, the ACLU of Nebraska, a beloved civil rights organization to new heights. During that time, I stayed actively involved in legislative policy and served as a member of the leadership team for the Coalition for a Strong Nebraska to help encourage more nonprofits to really embrace their, their power um, and their advocacy tools and abilities to make a positive difference in Nebraska. So not only do I wanna say thank you all for the generous invitation to join you all here today, but thank you for what you all do every day in our communities, um, serving some of our most vulnerable Nebraskans to help meet their basic needs and bringing those voices and those experiences into the halls of power, which is invaluable to charting good policy. So um, I've also been really honored to serve on a host of nonprofit boards from Legal Aid of Nebraska, the Nebraska Lawyers Trust Account Association, Research Nebraska, the Lincoln YWCA, so thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do and really excited about the dialogue here today. Excellent, thank you all for introducing yourself. Um, I'm now excited to introduce three nonprofit experts who uh, are on our meeting, in our meeting with us today, uh, who are going to give a little insight into what they are seeing with the constituents in our communities around the state. So first up, we have Tina Rockenbach with uh, Community Action of Nebraska, Tina. Good evening. I apologize for the background noise. I'm multitasking at its finest. Um, I am the executive director for Community Action of Nebraska. So we are the state association that helps provide support and PR and advocacy for all of our nine community action agencies. So if you're not familiar with community action, we have nine area agencies across the state covering all 93 counties. We also have our mid agency that also covers two counties in Kansas for Head Start and Early Head Start services. Um, we, as a state association, they are all members and we provide uh, support and technical assistance for things like training, data management, uh, fun, uh, grant monitoring, uh, reporting, technical assistance. We also provide um, additional training, both individualized and for the entire network. And then we're also that statewide voice for advocacy and policy uh, for our, our agencies, as well as the clientele that we serve. So um, it's a big task, but we've got a great network here in Nebraska. We, we are part of a national network um, as well. So lots of boots on the ground. Um, just a few things about what we're seeing. Some of the issues, challenges that we're still navigating through. Um, as with anything else, you know, COVID now is the benchmark to how we mark everything. Um, but the one thing about this pandemic that we are still kind of coming out of is that community action proved to be the boots on the ground to keep people afloat during all of the things that were happening and we're still continuing to do that. In fact, we've put out a pretty significant national report detailing those things. Um, as a result, we're still, we're plugging away. We actually developed so many new services and innovative services and delivery of those services as a result of the pandemic that we were able to reach more people, record numbers. And so now we're, we're moving forward and what does that look like as well as dealing with that increased need and the increased requests that we're seeing as a part of this inflationary economy and that negative economic impact. Um, yeah, a good portion of our people that we are serving statewide are in that 150% of federal poverty level household income or below. Um, and so to put that, if you're not sure what that is, just to give you a little benchmark for a family of four at 150% of federal poverty level is an income for the household of $42,000. Um, so a lot of those misconceptions out there that we're serving people who aren't working, they don't wanna work, they wanna ride the system, that's not accurate. We're dealing with people who have gainfully employed, they're just not, Either they don't have a living wage, they're dealing with all these increased costs, the dollars aren't going far enough, and then that's affecting everything. That's affecting everything from keeping the kids in daycare so they can go to school because they need to buy supplies, they need to buy the diapers, they need to buy the food, all of those things. We have a serious food security issue in this state, and we work closely hand in hand uh, with both the Food Bank of Lincoln and the Food Bank of the Heartland. All of our agencies run food pantries as well as a commodity supplemental food program. 
to our seniors and lots of Meals on Wheels and other programs to address food security and things are slim. We are really seeing that depletion, especially after this pandemic when we've had such an influx. Um, and then as with anything else, we're dealing with manpower struggles, especially in our Head Start areas. Um, so we fired schools back up here and, and we're back to doing things the way we usually do, but um, we have a serious Head Start and early Head Start manpower issue. Um, we feel very confident about our ability to address those of those challenges and those issues. Um, we are very proud of how we've responded to all of these things. Moving forward, what we need, we need partners. We need to be invited to the table. We need to have everyone see and understand that community action. We are experts on poverty. You know, we were founded on the war on poverty and the war on social justice, and we serve every single county in the state. So we need to be in those conversations. Call us, find us. Um, you can you can reach me. I'm located in Lincoln. I'm also um, the one that you'll see up at the Capitol representing community action as well. Um, so we just need open conversations. If I come to talk to you, just open conversation, even if we're not seeing eye to eye, open conversation, full transparency, um, and really discussing how we can eradicate this poverty issue that is a statewide issue. It's not just an urban issue. It's not just a localized issue to a certain area. It is significant statewide and it's, and it's growing in this post-pandemic state. Um, that was a lot, but that's what we're handling every day. So thank you all for being here. Um, please, please, please don't hesitate to contact me. And I hope to be visiting with a lot of you soon. Excellent. Thank you, Tina. Next up, we've got Josh Gilman from Kids Came Community Center. Thank you. Um, so I'm Josh Gilman, the Chief Operating Officer at Kids Can Community Center. Uh, I've been asked to speak a little bit about early childhood education. Uh, Kids Can has been serving the Omaha community for 114 years, uh, currently providing programs uh, all across the Omaha Metro with our headquarters on 49th and Q Street. Um, we're really excited at the start of 2023, we'll be moving a whole one block east uh, to 48th and Q Street uh, for our new home, which will allow us to double our capacity to serve students. Uh, so I've worked in this space for 15 years, but I have to say, leveled up my understanding uh, in March 2020 when my wife and I brought twins to our home. So I uh, thought I knew uh, the challenges and stresses of early childhood education, but uh, it turns out I did not until I have my own kids. Uh, I'll try to be brief because uh, I can talk about this stuff forever, but uh, I really want to focus on the main challenges uh, that are uh, facing the families we serve uh, in three buckets of accessibility, affordability, and uh, quality of care. Uh, so first on accessibility, uh, there just simply aren't enough childhood education providers in spaces in our communities. Um, it can routinely operates with an extensive waiting list. And uh, we hear from families who are calling around to us that it's just they're calling and calling places and there just aren't spaces for kids to go. And I think that only got worse through the pandemic. Uh, as I mentioned, we're doubling our capacity here in a couple months. And most of those spaces are already full and have been for some time. It uh, doesn't appear to be a unique experience for us. Um, a lot of recent uh, Nebraska-focused research said that 70% of mothers with infants and to toddlers who are working uh, have trouble finding care. Uh, and statewide studies said the vast majority of Nebraska households have both parents working. Uh, so obviously that means they need a place for their kids to go. Um, I think something that became painfully clear during the pandemic is that you know, childcare isn't kind of a nice luxury to have that without it, um, it inhibits our Nebraska workforce and just the general quality of life. Uh, so without childcare, it really uh, puts a strain on the adults as well. Uh, the second hurdle uh, we see most, um, and maybe the one that keeps people up at night the most is affordability. Uh, so According to the Department of Health and Human Services uh, guideline, a family shouldn't spend more than 10% of their household income on childcare. Uh, the average cost of childcare for a, per year uh, in the state of Nebraska is $11,000. So that means you would, don't test my math, that wasn't my strength, but I believe that means that a household needs to bring in $100,000 in income or more uh, to meet that guideline. Um, the simple fact is that a lot of families just don't. Uh, only 10% of the families we serve uh, make more than $60,000 per household. 
Uh, and I want to be clear, uh, similar to Tina mentioned, like if I see these families every day and know their stories, uh, these are parents who are working hard, often more than one job to try and support for their families. Uh, so it's not for lack of effort that that household income is below that threshold. Uh, one of the support systems that's in place, obviously, is the uh, child care subsidy program. Um, but I'd say, unfortunately, the way the rules are set up, historically, uh, providers are only reimbursed at a 60% rate of the market um, charges in the state. It's been temporarily increased to 75%, which is great. Uh, but that puts providers in a financial bind meaning less providers will accept students who are on subsidies, meaning less access to those who are actually most in need. Um, and I'll say we're really lucky as a nonprofit to be able to provide some uh, financial assistance to families, um, but that does all come from philanthropic support, which again makes a massive impact on families, but uh, it's unlikely that's a systemic, sustainable way to scale early childhood care. Uh, and the last point I'll talk about that routinely comes up is just uh, quality of the experience for children. So one of the things I'm most optimistic about in this space is in the last couple of years, there's been a real increase from parents as they inquire about care, not only wanting to know about how their child will be safe, but what type of experience their child will receive. Uh, so I don't know if that's from Nebraska Step Up to Quality program and their marketing campaigns or just general increase in conversations at the national level on what quality early childhood care means, not just daycare. Um, you know, it's an important piece that parents really care about quality. So as we talk about increasing access, just increasing slots isn't a solvent. It needs to be quality spots. And that can be child care centers, in-home care, in addition to our school systems. I think it's an all of the above approach. Um, and, you know, I would say finally that we work with students through 13 years old, so we think all investments in quality of life and supports for students are important, but a lot of research does show that one of the biggest bangs for our buck is investing early in intervention systems, the earlier the better. Uh, so as we consider kind of priorities for ourselves and across our communities, uh, early childhood care is a proven uh, high return on investment, so should be prioritized. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. And finally, we have Jasmine Harris with RISE. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jasmine Harris. I am the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy with RISE. Uh, we are a nonprofit here in Nebraska, one of the largest who is solely focused on habilitative programming for people who have been impacted by incarceration. So with our program, uh, we're six years old here in Nebraska. And we are operating a program in five of the 10 correctional facilities where we focus, and sorry, I got people running in and out of my house during this, <laughs> um, where we're focused on um, employment readiness, character development, and entre entrepreneurial mindset. And so what that looks like for us when we're operating this intense six month program, we get to know the individuals who are going through this program and we then start to offer re-entry services uh, pre-release. So our mission is to break generational cycles of incarceration. And we know that in order to do that, we have to start working with people before they even come back. But it's not only transforming people who are incarcerated to, for them to see themselves in a different light, it's also transforming the communities and building the empathy uh, that people need when they're coming home from incarceration. So the services that we also offer along with reentry goes into our family and youth program where we are working with those families as um, they're rebuilding these um, relationships and working with individuals to deal with some of those difficult um, emotions and um, conversations that come along with someone coming back home. We also have our uh, business academy. Um, again, entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurship is a focus of ours and individuals who have been system impacted, whether they've taken our program inside or not, if they wanna start a business, uh, we offer a 12 week class that begins to get them guided into that direction of starting their business. So working with individuals pre-COVID and now, the, the problems are still the same, right? And um, as Tina and as um, kids can talk about, Joshua kids can talk about, it really is, those same problems magnified and intensified times 10, because now you have to deal with the barriers that coming through this criminal justice system has put on individuals. So not only are they navigating 
trying to find housing. What does transitional housing look like? Um, and I know you've seen the articles and things come out. What does what does a safe transitional house look like um, while they're on parole? That then adds another layer. So they're not only trying to figure out where am I going to live, how am I going to pay for that, um, depending on what jobs I have been relegated to. Are there employers who are now giving me an opportunity? Um, where am I going to live? Because now we have a selected pot of landlords who will rent to people with criminal uh, backgrounds. And then is that going to be safe, affordable? So it just continues to compound. Um, you not only have that, you have issues with people who are navigating within the prison system itself. When we are looking at parole, um, probation, pardons, all of those things compound with the, um, with the people that we serve. And on the front side, when you're looking at people who are first getting into the criminal justice system and what that pretrial process looks like, when we're looking at uh, bail reform and how that impacts individuals long-term because they've now been um, put in jail for two to three weeks, how has that then impacted their employment? How has that impacted their housing? So these um, barriers that all of the people face again, intensifies and it magnifies where those gaps are. So as RISE, what we're doing, we are working alongside, walking alongside individuals, making sure we're able to connect them to community resources. So it's a lot of that uh, relationship building, what services are out there and how are we able to work with individuals to um, ensure that they're getting their needs met. Um, one of the major things that we saw through COVID which has, I think, always been there that a lot of people are now really starting to talk about is the mental health and substance use that follows individuals um, throughout this, this lifespan of being impacted by the system because maybe they were incarcerated to begin with because of a mental health disorder or a substance use. And then now they have to ensure that they're sober when they come home. And then if they aren't sober, if they aren't um, dealing with their mental health and they relapse or go back into these situations, it then makes them uh, have to have revocation on their parole, which sends them back into the system. So again, there's a lot of um, things where we can say poverty and mental health and things like that have been criminalized that we continue to have to deal with day in and day out, um, working with the people we serve. So those are just some of the things that we see a lot um, as we are working. And as Josh said, a lot of the funding that we get is philanthropic dollars, right? And when we're trying to connect people and we're trying to uh, work through whatever crisis they have and those dollars are finite. So I think it's when it comes to the legislature and in that position that you'll hold, how do we ensure that we are serving the people of Nebraska with the dollars that we have um, to make a greater impact? Thank you, Jasmine. And thank you to all of our nonprofit experts. You play such a vital role in our communities and we are so appreciative of the time you took uh, to talk about your work here. Um, so now we are about to move on to the candidate questions. Um, each of the candidates will have two minutes to answer a couple questions. First of all, now that you have heard the vital role nonprofits play in the economy and in communities, what's your plan to work with and support nonprofits? And then the second question is if elected, what will your top three priorities be in the upcoming like upcoming legislative session? Now we do have a very sophisticated timekeeping <laughs> uh, system uh, that we will use here today. So I'm gonna hand it over to Hannah to explain that for us. Okay, so I had this really cool idea to do the hearing room lights. So red, oh, hold, let me repin myself here. Perfect. I had this really cool system going where it was going to be like the testimony room and it's going to be green, red, yellow, but it didn't work. So now we have these really cool nonprofit flashcards instead. So um, when you have 20 seconds left, I will put up the red and I will spotlight myself. So we'll both be on the screen. And then when it gets down to zero, I will put, or did I say yellow, sorry. When I, we get down, I'll go red and then you will, will move on to the next candidate after you finish that first stop. So thank you so much and hope Sorry to bear with our lovely cards. So I'll turn it back over to Rosie. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, so um, two minutes per candidate, and we are going to call on the candidates by district in reverse order this time. So we will start with District 46, Danielle Conrad. 
Rosie, you got to give me a heads up. I thought I had plenty of time oh, no. to, to listen so to everybody. Sorry. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Good to see you. Hi, hi, hi. Okay. Um, so my top three priority issues, if honored to be elected for the third time, would be tools to help working families succeed, tools to help small businesses succeed, and a strong public education pre-K through college. Um, those have always been the key priorities and hallmarks of my legislative work and will continue to be moving forward. I wanna give a couple of specifics about um, bills that I've identified that I didn't, I'd introduced in 2023 if honored to be elected and would love to have your help and feedback on as well. But there's about 10 or 12 of our sister states that have a state child care tax credit on the books. Nebraska does not. We know that child care is a key issue facing working families and a key factor in addressing our workforce solution. So I'm really excited to get to work on um, common sense policies like that that deliver for working families. Um, additionally, uh, it's no surprise to anybody, but we really have a historic opportunity, both because of federal COVID relief dollars and state general funds, which continue to outpace projections to make historic investments in key issues and areas. And I think everyone can agree that workforce is really a top issue for us in Nebraska. So how can we utilize that historic funding to address things that are attendant there too? child care, education, training, infrastructure, mental health. Those are the kinds of pieces that we can find a lot of common ground on with each other. And we're going to need your feedback and help um, to make those historic fundraising de um, funding decisions. But the good news is, even though we have a lot of challenges, we have resources and we can change the face of Nebraska now and for generations to come by working together. Thank you so much for the opportunity to weigh in. Great to see everybody again today. Thank you very much. And next we'll go to District 40, Barry Decay. He had to step out early, so I think he unfortunately already had to go. Okay, great. Thank you. Then we'll move on to District 36, Angie Lauritsen. Hello, friends, again. Um, what we really learned during the pandemic is that, and like Jill said earlier, was that nonprofits are really the boots on the ground. So understanding what the vital needs are in each community, having those nonprofits is vital. Then making sure that we have a real pulse of what exactly is needed for each different community. Uh, I work uh, with Lift Up Sarpy County when we're helping families that are facing homelessness and food insecurity, having those funds be able to come in to a, an organization that already has a collaborative network of different nonprofits that we are working with to be able to allocate funds to families that are really needing it, I think is super vital. And so having that nonprofit, nonprofit experience on um, being able to lean on that experience, I think is super vital to um, the work that I will, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, um, be able to work with. So understanding that and be able to see exactly what is happening in those communities to know what um, issues and problems need to be fixed, I think will be super vital. Um, if I'm lucky enough to get elected, um, obviously I stated earlier, making sure that kids are growing up in safe homes. So what that means is that we are providing quality public education to our kiddos. That means that we have accessibility to healthcare and mental health services. It means that we are providing uh, clean air and water for our kiddos. And, you know, obviously making sure in my district, uh, property tax relief is at the top of the list for a lot of families. And so making sure that people can stay in their homes is, is incredibly vital. Uh, in Sarpy County, the, the largest driver for homelessness in Sarpy County is medical bills. So making sure that we have services on the ground that can try to make sure that our families are able to stay in their homes is super vital too. So I look forward to working on all of these problems if I am elected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll move on to District 31, Senator Kathleen Kaug. Am I, am I unmuted? There we go. Um, okay, so question one. Um, so nonprofits are so incredibly important and they fill that gap, but we need to make sure that they're not dependent on government fluctuations and funds. Um, nonprofits that can survive the ups and downs of 
whether or not we've got a surplus or you know we've lost money, that is the kind of nonprofit that will be very, very successful and be able to provide long-term community support. So helping those nonprofits develop good business practice, create um, partnerships with other nonprofits and with other businesses to help support, support and sustain them is going to be critically important. Um, I did. I had one question actually earlier for um, Josh. I wanted to know, and he can clarify this to me later. Is that eleven thousand per child or eleven thousand per family for the child care? So sorry, that was just one of my notes. Um, so developing nonprofit strategies so that they can be strong no matter what's going on around them is critically important to me. Um, when when we talk about my priorities for the legislature, lowering our taxes spreading it out. Right now, we, we are in quite a um, fluctuating system. Um, we have so many more services. We are a goods-based tax um, system. So we need to figure out how do we adjust how we tax, whether we broaden out our base so that people are not paying as much individually. Um, and we need to make sure that, uh, as I have gone door to door, property tax, property tax, property tax. Um, I think Angie, you just mentioned people are being taxed out of their homes. And I've talked to eight people this week who have said, um, my kids have grown up. I paid for the schools, which was great. I love them. But now I'm here in this house and I'm still paying the taxes and there's no reason for me to be here. So I have to leave because I'm on a fixed income and the taxes keep going up. Um, in Douglas County, our taxes, our um, valuations have gone through the roof. I talked to one person whose house value went up $250,000 in one year. He had done nothing to the property. So we need to make sure that as those things um, are being evaluated, that we are not letting them get out of control. So uh, at attracting and keeping talent, um, one of the my favorite things um, nonprofit-wise was to, uh, helping develop a Cristo Ray feasibility study in Des Moines. We had a Crystal Ray school here in Omaha. Um, it didn't wind up uh, working out mostly because it hit the recession and it was not strong enough yet. It didn't have enough um, strength outside of, of donations or government. And so, um, but its primary purpose was to teach kids how to work and it connected them with businesses. So you have kids who might not um, understand why you need to learn algebra actually working and helping an accountant in a business. So, oh, sorry, uh -huh. I'm done. Thank you. All right, now we'll move on to District 28, Jane Raybould. Hi everyone again. Um, you know, I am grateful for the nonprofits in our community and our state. You know, I consider them the lifeblood of, and the heart of our community, much like our neighborhood associations. The volunteerism is essential. The work that you do is essential. And I can tell you as a, a former Lancaster County Commissioner and on the Lincoln City Council, I am in awe of the funding that you do get from the, the city and the county as well as the state and how you're able to take that money and leverage it and do the tremendous good that you do. Um, I know that when I was on the Community Health Endowment Board of Trustees, we tried to figure out ways to help you maximize those dollars even more because you provide the services that the city and the county and the state can no longer provide and you do it much more efficiently than we can but i know the community health endowment board of trustees was trying to find ways where we can help with the administrative costs that you all face and that was an idea of trying to combine uh, different nonprofits like the cultural community centers together to have one type of administrative oversight that they could tap into where they wouldn't have to duplicate that. So I do recognize a tremendous value and the wonderful use of any type of funding that you get, you stretch it, you make it last longer, and you continue to do the great things in our community. What are some of my priorities as I launch into this new legislative opportunity for myself and my community? You know, I, as a county commissioner, I have a lot of baggage uh, about the cost shifting that the state has done on public education. 
shortchanging public education. You know, we see the overcrowding in the penitentiary. We need criminal justice reform. And those are some things I'm always very interested in. But as I started this journey running for this legislative district, I realized that there are so many other things that I'm interested in. And number one is trying to right-size the imbalance in the reimbursables for all those healthcare providers, our nursing home, our daycare and childcare centers, the underfunding that they're getting in our government. And I'd like to work on uh, DHHS committee as well as working for the banking insurance because I think they dovetail. And I think they need a strong business mind to try to figure out how we can get the funding to those critical needs that ultimately all relate to job and workforce. So if we close that nursing home out in Madison, you know, that's a large employer of those folks in that community, but it's a place where our loved ones can go and get tremendous care. So I look at it as economic reinvestment in our state of Nebraska by right-sizing the funding and making sure that the reimbursables are fair so that these entities can stay in operation. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, District 26, George Jungen. Well, I want to do my best to not repeat things that other people have said, um, but I think it's difficult because I know everybody here really cares about what we're talking about. As I said earlier, you know, a lot of my interaction with nonprofits has been from my work as a public defender and the people that I work with on a regular basis as a public defender have a lot of overlap um, with the kind of people that work with a number of the nonprofits that are happening or working um, that a number of people here are talking about. Um, I'm sorry, my fiance just got home and my dog is freaking out a little bit right now. So <laughs> I'm trying to do this in the dining room while that's happening too. Um, as I also said, I, I currently serve on the board of the bridge. And one of the things that I see on the board of the bridge is that these nonprofits that do amazing work for folks in our community um, have these hoops to jump through and red tape that they have to go through so much so anymore that they're hiring entire positions of people to take care of some of these things. And that's a problem. You know, our nonprofits are incredible. They do a ton of work for folks that really save lives. And oftentimes they pick up the slack um, where government is not doing enough, I think. Um, and I laud uh, and applaud the, the nonprofits for doing that. Um, but we need to make it easier for them. We need to make sure that nonprofits have the funding that they need to actually effectuate the change they're trying to do in the community. And we have to make sure that those uh, funding mechanisms are not incredibly difficult and complicated. We have to make it easier for people to have access to the things they need to make change. Um, so to that effect, you know, what are some of the things that I would be prioritizing in the legislature? Uh, we've all touched on it. Um, a lot of the issues that we're talking about here today are interconnected, but all of them, I think, ultimately link back to education. Having early childhood education, pre-K all the way through, uh, access to skilled labor or college education is vital. And so I would make sure that we continue to support a robust public education system here in Nebraska, because that really is the great equalizer that gives everybody opportunity and helps rise all of us up out of whatever situation we may come from. Uh, in addition to that, I want to do everything I possibly can to uh, better fund access to substance use, substance use disorder treatment and mental health uh, treatment. I mean, we talk about safe communities, and I think a lot of that starts in making sure people have access to the services they need early on, instead of just trying to put fires out after they happen. So making sure people have ac access to those services. And then finally, it's, it's amplifying the voice of the people that we're all talking about. You know, people like me, um, have our voices heard all the time, um, but there's entire populations of people out there that don't get listened to because they don't frankly have access to the mechanisms to speak. So I think we all need to be using our ability in the legislature to speak on behalf of those who don't otherwise get heard. And that's something that I would try to do to help partner with nonprofits. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next District 20, John Fredrickson. Thank you again. And uh, yeah, to, to George's point, I, I will do my best to uh, not echo what everyone else is saying. It's um, I, I'm actually really, um, you know, it's I, I love hearing what everyone's saying because it's inspiring. And um, so uh, thank you everyone for sharing. So uh, first question is, um, you know, uh, how to um, work and support nonprofits. So I, I hope to work really closely with nonprofits and I'm honored with the seats. Um, you know, I think that we're really fortunate in Nebraska to have a wide spectrum of nonprofit services that serve a really diverse spectrum of needs. And um, as so many of others have said, nonprofits really have a finger on the pulse of what's happening in people's day-to-day -day lives, uh, what policies, what um, 
uh, what legislation is really impacting folks, what's going to be consequential, and what's going to really move the needle on a number of different issues. So I hope to utilize that expertise and tap into that expertise in whatever way I possibly can uh, when uh, if I'm uh, honored with the seat. Um, in terms of a priority perspective, um, you know, my number one priority is, is going to be mental health. Um, so as I said earlier, my educational backgrounds in social work, um, I'm a mental health provider by profession. I have a private practice where I do outpatient mental health services. And, um, you know, I'm really interested in bringing that perspective, that voice to the table in the legislature. We don't currently have any mental health subject matter experts in Lincoln. Um, and I think that that perspective is extraordinarily valuable, um, obviously, as it pertains to healthcare policy, mental health policy, um, but really any policy that's going to have a direct impact on uh, uh, the day-to-day -day lives of Nebraskans. So that would be my number one priority. Um, my number two, um, I really uh, would be passionate about just making sure we're prioritizing policies that are actually having impact on our day-to-day -day lives. So looking at how can we address workforce retention issues. Um, you know, again, from a behavioral health perspective, we have a workforce shortage in all 93 counties throughout our state. Uh, we're seeing this in a lot of the different healthcare perspectives, but we're seeing this um, in, in uh, industries um, statewide. So uh, how can we ensure we have policies in place that are gonna attract and retain talent in our state, um, investing in education, uh, investing in um, childcare to uh, some of the points that were earlier, you know, these are things that are all interconnected and having a great impact on um, our ability to attract, retain talent, and keep folks in the workforce. So those would be my biggest priorities. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is District 16, Connie Peterson. Um, hi, again, uh, John. I almost could echo almost everything that you just said, too. So thank you very much for what you just said. Um, I, I agree. We do need to focus on um, health and behavioral health needs and addiction needs. That's very, um, very much something I'm passionate about in the work that I do. Uh, here in Norfolk. And I do know um, the District 16 is a very rural district. And so being able to have um, systems to address the workforce shortage in that area. Um, as the clinical director here, I do a lot of training with interns. And I think that's an incredibly important um, role to take on because I want to not only train uh, great behavioral health providers, but also then keep them in the rural areas. No offense for the urban folks, um, but we want to keep them here and we want to do that. So that um, you know, hopefully with help of like the National Health Service Corps and other loan repayment programs that we can um, sustain what we, uh, what we need here in our um, entire state of Nebraska. So you know, I wanna um, also thank uh, Josh Gilman, you know, you really that you took my three words out of my mouth, um, accessibility, availability, and affordability really are the, the three key uh, points to being able to address our healthcare shortage. And so whatever we need to do, of course, I've been, uh, we've been scrounging here in Norfolk for 15 years to try and figure out how we can have a psychiatric provider and, and be able to serve our clientele in a quick fashion. So anything that could support that. Um, I also believe the support of the small businesses um, and, and the volunteer fire and rescue that keep our small towns um, continuing to flourish. If we lose our small towns, I, I understand that, um, that uh, sometimes folks still might leave those small towns to go and work in more urban areas. We need our small towns, we need our small bus businesses, and a lot of those businesses are going to be nonprofit businesses. So anything I can do to support um, the rural environment of Nebraska is incredibly important. Um, and of course, then I, I also believe that agriculture and farming is incredibly important. So there are a lot of businesses, nonprofit businesses that really do support what we try to do across the entire state of Nebraska. There, are, there is a, a vast uh, number of farmers and agricultural individuals who really do support a lot of, of, of the state in a number of levels. And we need to make sure that we are, we are not forgetting them in this process. So I very much thank you for the time and I look forward to the next steps. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to District 12, Robin Richards. Yeah, so a lot of my um, goals uh, echo what my friends said up here on this panel. Um, I am definitely into making sure that healthcare is accessible and it is affordable. Um, I lost a nephew to cancer and his mother will pay a bill for the rest of her life that reminds her that her child passed away. That cannot be our healthcare system. I care very deeply about educational training and making sure that we're not only um, doing education pre-K through college, but that we're actually changing the way that we 
fund education in our state because that is the only way we get property tax relief. That is the only way we have to shift that. So when we do that, we will have the money to um, actually double the state aid for almost every single school in the entire state. And what we should do with that is career training. We're talking about attracting we need to grow our own. We could be doing it right here. Ralston trains 26 different programs out of our school, and we are not so unique that we couldn't get that all the way across our state. So making sure that funding is there for our schools. Um, and then what would I do for nonprofits? How would I work with them and for them? Continuing that they have uh, support and the grants and funding that they need to get going and stay afloat. During the hardest times of COVID, it was government funding that kept some of them alive and going. Um, so we never want to see that those funds dry up. But I really would like to make a task force or a committee that is looking into are we the most effective we could be in giving the funds that we do to the people that we do? Are we investing in the people we should be? And furthermore, I would also create a caucus that would support nonprofits in our legislature that would be there to talk about the ways that we can be there for, for you all. Um, and then finally, I would really look at the small business programs that we have going in Nebraska. What are the ones that are very successful? Because nonprofits are our business. They just invest their income differently. They reinvested in themselves in that nonprofit. And so what can we be expanding from small business into being all the way into nonprofits also? What programs are beneficial for everyone? And then finally, as a legislator, I have worked for a very long time in arts and nonprofit and um, accessibility. And one of the things that I learned there was the phrase, nothing about us without us, which means if you're gonna tell my story, let me be a part of the narrative. And so my promise to you as a legislator is that if I'm writing legislation about you, it will not be without you, that I will find your voice and make sure that that is part of the legislation I'm writing. Thank you. Next up is District 10, Senator Wendy DeBoer. Wendy, I think you're muted. Oh, my, sorry, am I there now? Gotcha. Yep, okay, sorry. I was saying thank you for having me. So there you go. Um, you asked how I would interact uh, with nonprofits in the future. And I take that as a process question, which is sort of one of the things that I'm very interested in and in, in how legislation is uh, worked through the process. I think that it's very important to have nonprofit voices come to educate. Uh, nonprofits are often the boots on the ground on a lot of issues. And so um, in the last four years, and if I'm uh, honored to be reelected for the next four years, my interaction with nonprofits in part would be to educate me and to help me understand um, a lot of what uh, I was working on in terms of legislation and the, the consequences of the legislation to make sure there aren't unintended consequences. I think that um, nonprofits are really helpful partners to ground legislation in data. So that's really important to me as well. Um, I've worked the, the three, uh, different topics that you had in the program earlier, it's as though you wrote those for me. I was like, hey, the, the food banks, I, I worked on that legislation last time, that, uh, that bump in the providers on early childhood education uh, was a bill of mine last session. And um, I've worked uh, with RISE and other uh, groups on the judiciary quite extensively. So uh, continuing to work with those and all the other groups in the future. My three um, uh, issues to highlight for you tonight, education and workforce, part of that is that childcare subsidy um, because we know that that is going, the, we wrote the, the subsidy in 21 to, to sunset in 23. And we have a group, a nonprofit, who is doing a, a study to see the effects of that and whether what it's doing is helping us to get the workforce that we wanted out of it. And so um, I think we, we might need to uh, extend that sunset because I don't think they've had time to, to do the, the study fully because it didn't start quite as quickly as it should have. Um, safe neighborhoods, that includes mental health supports, problem solving courts, rehabilitation, making sure that we have the programs uh, in our correction facilities 
so that folks are not rehabilitating or not re recidivating. Um, and then finally, the middle class tax cuts. That's a big priority of mine in these next four years uh, to keep up with the highest income tax cuts that we did uh, last year. So in those income tax cuts from last year, somebody who makes $20 an hour would get $7 a year. So um, we have a whole lot of people in the state of Nebraska who did not uh, get the benefits of those tax cuts, middle-class tax cuts of all types. Uh, that's one of the big things that I will also be working on in the next four years if I have the honor of being reelected. Thank you so much again for inviting me. Thank you. Next up, we have from District 8, Senator Megan Hunt. Thanks a lot. Lots of good answers all around. Um, I love Nebraska. I really do. And honestly, it wouldn't be such a great place to live without all of the work that our local nonprofits do because they really care about making it a better state because they're operated by staff and volunteers who have a bigger vision for this state than anyone else. Um, and our nonprofit staffers and volunteers are the dreamers and doers in our communities. And they really make magic with very little. They really make a difference in people's lives. And at the same time, when I look at the massive support and effort that goes into the work of these nonprofit organizations, I think to myself, you know, if we just lived in a culture that valued people's well being, that valued people's education and health and their work and the dignity of their work what could all of these amazing individuals and nonprofits have done with all of those hours? And I just think about how much we could raise the level of discourse, how much confidence and happiness and fulfillment could be generated in our state and what the value of that would be for our economy, honestly. Um, if people could just wake up in one of the wealthiest countries on earth and simply feel reassured of their basic rights and their basic needs. So I support nonprofit organizations and those who staff them and those who volunteer for them wholeheartedly, and I always will, but I would feel foolish and irresponsible if I had this platform, I have this platform now as a state senator, and I would feel dumb if I didn't support their work and do my part to influence the other side of the public service sphere. And that's elected officials who can be smarter with our tax dollars and more compassionate about the small role that government needs to play, that government needs to play in supporting those who need it most. Somebody said earlier that they love nonprofits because they do the work that government doesn't need to do. And I could not disagree more. We have the resources in the state to make sure that people do not fall through the cracks and that they can have all their basic needs met and they can have a high quality of life in our state. But we are relying on these very under-resourced organizations while they get funding cut, you know, whether that's coming from public funding or from private funding. Um, they're working so hard to fulfill the needs that people have in our state, while the rest of us, while everybody pays taxes to a government that doesn't serve us, that's not giving us the quality public education that we need, that's not filling the gap in the health care that we need, that's not keeping our roads and our cities safe. And I think that no matter what side of the political conversation you're on, whether you're conservative or progressive or whatever, everybody is running for office and everybody is politically activated because they feel government is messing up. The government isn't serving us quite the way we need. And that's where we ask nonprofits to step in and fill in the gap. And I think that that's a shame. Um, while we try to overcome that by electing good people, um, you know, my goal is really just to make most of the work nonprofits do unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you. And then next up first from District 6 is Christian Merch. There we go. Uh, thank you again for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to learn from you all. Um, so yes, working with nonprofits, uh, I understand that nonprofits uh, suffer from uh, financial insecurity from, from year to year based on uh, how much they can receive from philanthropic donors or what they're able to achieve in grants. So helping uh, nonprofits obtain grants, whether it's state grants or federal grants, uh, and making it a streamlined process to where we're helping uh, at the state level with nonprofits being able to apply for those grants. 
Um, and then a big part of it is making sure that taxpayers have more of their own, retain more of their own money so that they can make those discretionary spending uh, decisions and uh, give money to, to, the, uh, to the nonprofits. Uh, so doing those, those things, and that's kind of ties in with, uh, with the three priorities that I have uh, going into the legislature uh, is tax reform. Uh, we need to make sure that we are uh, making sure that taxpayers are keeping uh, more of their hard-earned dollars, and I think nonprofits will uh, end up reaping the benefit of that because you will see more philanthropic uh, activity from, from the general public. Uh, public safety, uh, developing programs that reduce recidivism, uh, so the working with the RISE program is something that I look forward to doing. Uh, so that we're setting up uh, people who are coming out of uh, incarceration so that they're reintegrating into society uh, and that we're setting them up for long-term success. And then uh, my last priority uh, or, you know, my top, my third top priority uh, is uh, making sure that we have the best education in the United States uh, here in Nebraska. And I wanna see that education from early childhood care and development all the way to our university system. And so setting up uh, our young Nebraskans for success long-term is something that I'm, uh, I look forward to doing and working with nonprofits because uh, you guys are a driving force. Excellent, thank you. And from District 6, Senator Michaela Kavanaugh. All right, thank you. Um, first, I want to start off by celebrating um, something that I think we all should be celebrating, a victory that we just saw. The ARC of Nebraska announced, I think it was yesterday, that the Department of Health and Human Services was able to take 500 people off the developmental disabilities waiting list. And I bring that up because I think, first of all, that's monumental. And I'm grateful to the work of the department and all of the advocates that have done so much around this issue over the last couple of years. We increased funding this last session. We took the government, governor had um, made a recommendation for increased funding for the developmental disabilities wait list. And we took that funding. And then I also made a recommendation or request for additional funding. And they, the appropriations committee added additional funding from my request as well. And so this is really a historic moment that I hope we can all celebrate together because this is what it means for nonprofits and the government to work together and to make the lives of Nebraskans better. And so many people and families, that's 500 people, that means 500 families are going to be benefiting from this and that's huge. I also am thrilled that we passed my family support waiver to help uh, families who, are, who have children that are under the age of 19 but are on the developmental dis disabilities wait list. So now that they can get access to resources while they wait for their child to be accepted onto that wait list, including access to Medicaid, um, something that was really a hard thing to do because they weren't financially qualified because they made too much money and making too much money looks like a family of four making $50,000. So these are not people that were extremely well off, that were not having access to services for their children because they couldn't get access to Medicaid. Again, this is how it's supposed to work. We collaborate. Um, I very much appreciate the collaboration that I've done over the last four years with so many of the people that have been on this call. Jasmine Harris and I have worked on healthy pregnancies for incarcerated women. And um, my freshman year, we were able to pass legislation that made it so that uh, women who are pregnant while incarcerated cannot be shackled. And if they are shackled, it has to be documented. There was no documentation going on. So we didn't know even if people were being shackled while pregnant. So that's a huge victory for human rights within our justice system, uh, system and for women. My priorities over the next four years will be pretty much reflective of what my priorities have been healthcare, financial insecurity, and trying to make sure that being poor is no longer a full-time job. Um, when it comes to healthcare, maternal and infant health are where I focus a lot of my interest and energy. I continue to advocate for and fight for Medicaid expansion postpartum up to a year, something that we weren't able to get out of the committee last session, but I hope this next session we will. I will continue to advocate for family support or for developmental and intellectual disabilities, for fundings, for changing our waiver system, for ensuring that our waivers are serving the people most in need in the best way possible. Increased investment in mental health so that we are making sure that as everyone has talked about today, the significance of mental and behavioral health in the state and the crisis we are in, it is increasing our prison population. It is 
causing disruptions in our school system. We are seeing a rise in suicide rates and we are seeing a rise in death in maternal health as well because of mental health issues. And then when it comes to food insecurity, last uh, in 2021, my bill for universal school meals made it out of the education committee unanimously. Unfortunately, it didn't have a priority. So I will reintroduce that again this next year, even though we saw the benefits of that through the federal government um, making it a reality for short term, I think that we can make it a reality for the long term and see long term benefits of children having food in their bellies all day so that they can learn really well. I want to make sure that again, food insecurity across the board, eligibility to SNAP, housing uh, eligibility, childcare subsidy eligibility, increasing all of those, and also working to reduce the cliff effect are things that I think are extremely important. And the final thing is my reason for running in the first place, paid family medical leave. I'm sorry if I missed the yellow and red cards. <laughs> We try are to talk fast. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. We are over time. We're going to move on to District Four, which is Cindy Mas Maxwell Ostick, please. Thank you uh, so much for holding this forum this evening. I've been learning all along, not from only the candidates that are speaking, but the uh, people who had talked earlier from their nonprofit uh, background, and I feel like I would run out of time as well. So I'm going to start with the end in mind and just say that as a future state senator, I will be learning a lot and trying to focus on evidence-based decisions when I'm representing my district. And as someone who's been involved with the legislative study group for the past few years, we've been focused on trying to help everyday Nebraskans be more involved, um, take up their responsibility and the privilege of being active members of the second house. I have been in the legislature testifying at hearings or recording them from home and been so pleased to see many members of the nonprofit association advocating for the people that they serve. And I think that that is so important. And I'm hoping more senators will be able to um, hear these stories, hear um, the needs and try to understand them at a more direct level. And I think that would happen if we can also intentionally bring more people that we're serving to the legislature. So I think that that is an area that I would really like to try to focus on and um, I understand that I have uh, privilege and I would want to make sure that we're intentionally looking for input and feedback from people who are from, um, you know, all walks of life, all income levels, um, you know, disability, age, and um, for, uh, for certain regarding any Black, Indigenous, other neighbors of color, and um, national origin. So I have this special interest that we make sure that we're focusing on people from LGBTQ families as well. And I feel like when I am talking about my priorities, they're all interconnected. The business of our government is to serve everybody. And I feel like sometimes we're focused in the legislature too much on party politics and division where I actually am talking with so many people that we have a lot in common. And I think that we need to bring that back. As far as priorities, I'd like to focus on business. I have a background in uh, human resources and recruiting. So I have a role, a uh, strong, keen uh, focus on that as well as in um, education and uh, tax improvements. I really have a lot of ideas in that area too. So I'm running out of time, but I wanted to thank all of you. I'm excited about what we could try to do in the legislature. Thank you all so much. This has been really wonderful. I really appreciate all of your thoughtful answers to our questions. Um, and I'm now going to turn it back over to Hannah to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Rosie. 
Um, I want to thank all the candidates again, once again, for attending. We know this is a super busy time of the year, so we're really grateful you were able to join us. If you could stay on after this just for a second, we are going to try to take a picture, a little Zoom picture. And this was recorded, so we will be sending out to those who couldn't attend and will be put up on, I know, our socials and our YouTube and most likely CSNs as well. Um, we will be sending out candidate bios so everyone can learn a little bit more about you because I know we cut a lot of you off. So we will be sending those out along with the recording. So I wanted to say thank you again to all those who attended as well, especially on a Tuesday night. So we really appreciate your time and thank you all so much. Okay, everyone smile. I'm gonna try to take a picture. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you all so much. We really, really appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourselves in the home stretch.